My name is Andrew Irving. I'm from the Department of French and Italian. This is actually my second time here, which is kind of nice. I wish I had more time to do things like this. And um, last time I talked about an advanced um, writing workshop class and um, successes and problems we had with dealing with just a, a Skype um, interview with um, a newspaper and their editorial team in France. It was really cool we've got a video of that that you can go check out. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. So this time though, I'm going to talk about something a little different. I'm going to talk about um, a, an online platform that we use in third semester French. It's used in a couple other courses here on campus in the languages. And um, I'm really here to um, take advantage of your expertise and intelligence and get some feedback. Because um, you'll see by the end of this, one of the biggest problems that we have is that we have a hard time getting students to take advantage of everything that these resources offer them, no matter what we say to them sometimes. No, not no matter what we say, but we say a lot to them. It doesn't seem to always work. Um, and uh, we have a hard time, especially getting students to actually study the material before they do the activities. So um, Margaret mentioned to me last week or so we should think about things like workflow, for example, how, how we create a better workflow for the students. So I'm going to see if you guys can help. Um, truth in advertising, as of the last six months or so, I'm also a consultant for Vista. So I'm not here to sell Vista at all. It sells itself. So I'm not here to do that. Um, they brought me on since I've been using their books since 2008, and they noticed that I'm pretty active with how it works and its technology and everything. So um, it's been a lot of fun. I work with some very, very um, 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 active teaching uh, language <coughs> teachers from across the country. And we have a couple of conferences where we work together. And the nice thing about Vista, this is my transition into talking about them briefly, is that they don't want me to push this book. This is, I'm just going to show, I'm using this book that we use. But as consultants, we don't push the book. As consultants, actually, we push things like learning, learning with online platforms, the advantages and disadvantages, things like that. So um, let me tell you a little about Vista. I started using um, a Vista book in, in 2008. I was looking for something different. Our um, textbook that we had before that played again that trick that a lot of textbooks do, where they change about 25% of the book and they can come out with a new edition. Changing 25% of the book meant switching out a couple um, pictures and um, um, changing some headings and things like that. And there was the book had problems still. It wasn't great. And I just said, you know, I'm no longer going to support that. So I, I looked for. Uh, uh, different option, and Vista was just coming on the market. Vista is a, um, is a publisher that only publishes language books. Everybody that works for Vis Vista is passionate about language. They have masters or PhDs in language. Some of them have BAs in language. They teach language. S the, the, the tech support people, the p receptionist, uh, if you talk to, everybody is a language person which is really, really great when you're dealing with a textbook. So when you call with an issue in the book, um, the person there knows exactly what's going on from a pedagogical or a linguistic as well as a technological standpoint. So it's really great working for them, um, or using them. I don't work for them that much, um, to be honest. So um, they are, um, one of the things Vista was a pioneer in is in creating an online learning environment um, where students can, um, that, that accompanies the book. We've had some other models before that, but some of the problems that exist is that the, the content was not very well coordinated with what's going on in the book. A um, lot of technological issues. Vista has technological issues sometimes because they're always evolving, always changing. But um, uh, what I want to say, they um, pretty much it seems to be working very well. Our, most of our TAs um, uh, report that they really enjoy teaching with this. It saves them a lot of time. All of the, act, if you've ever taught language, you know that uh, language teachers, sometimes half of their life is just grading A, B, B, A, C. True, false, false, true, true, false, things like that. Uh, adding an accent, taking away things. Um, this online platform does a lot of that for you, so you can spend more time. I don't think our TAs are spending less time preparing for class. They spend more time preparing a really good class and grading where they really need to use their expertise. And we're letting the computer do what the computer can do, which is kind of nice. Um, so the other thing Vista does really nice is as language teachers, we always want students to have as much input as possible, meaning uh, uh, visual or oral or text coming into them. And so this online platform allows us to send them home with much more active, um, live, sometimes input. And uh, it makes the language learning, I think, a little bit more exciting for them. And the last thing I wanted to mention, which is um, uh, uh, escaping me now, is probably not as important. So um, <laughs> I'll skip that for now. So um, 
did everybody have a chance by any, to, to take a peek, log in, or look? Or if you didn't, it's OK. But um, what I'm showing you here is uh, how this looks from my, um, uh, my standpoint as a teacher. And, and, and um, this is the section that I created you right here. So um, uh, what I'm going to go to, though, however, is I can't really see my own, uh, what the students see here. So um, if, you wouldn't, um, if you wouldn't mind, could you, um, if you haven't um, and you'd like to, if you've got a laptop in front of you, do you want to try to log in to this and see? Now, everybody who was, uh, everybody should be able to log in here um, if you'd like. And I'll just give you a couple little steps. I didn't write them out. But basically, you go to vhcentral.com. And uh, the, um, the only thing you need to know is when they ask for a code, if you haven't logged in, when they ask for a code, you skip that step. And then um, eventually I'll be able to let you in to look at this book. And then so you can go ahead, if you haven't, um, do one of this first set of activities. Am I, which one are I looking at? This one. This first set of activities that is um, after the logging in right here, looking at some of those things right there when you <coughs> land on the page. And a lot of it's very doable from your phone or from a, uh, an iPad. It just doesn't have flash. So some of the things, movies and things, don't always don't work on your phone. Yeah, I don't, purposely I'm not telling you. So just go to vhlcentral.com and see if you can um, figure out how to log in. The reason being is that this is what's going on in a student's mind quite often. They, they don't read what we give them. We send them tons of information before the semester starts. Well, they get uh, a big handout in the book when they buy it, and then they really just are sitting on the bus and trying to do this. So the only thing you need to know that's different is if you need a code, you just skip that step. If you skip that step, eventually I should see you. So I'm going to go back to me, and you're going to see how fun this is. This is a very nice thing that Vista does, is um, they allow this thing called grace periods for college students who are waiting for financial aid. So it allows me to let you in um, to the course even though you didn't pay anything yet. Now, if you wouldn't mind, I mean, once you're in, kind of just take a, take a peek um, at the, the, what's called the course view, your landing page. And um, there's a few things that we want you to look at. Um, what are your assignments? How, how would you go to do assignments? Take a look at my study center and see the tools that are there. Um, some of the books have a much more robust study center than this one. Um, I'll go take a, I'll go, no, I'll stay there. Take a, um, Look at the class bulletin in case there's any announcements for you from me, which there are not. And then the related video. And um, it asks you to click on the first video there just to play around and see what you think. Check out the subtitles function, for example. That would be, yeah, it's just me. This, is, this wouldn't normally happen to students. Um, this is, are you Amy? Yeah, this is just um, what happens for the one or two students that come to you and say, I can't buy my book yet. And you say, well, I have a solution. Hold on. So, but we're, we're using that option to do this demo here. No, skip the code. If it asks for skip code, the code, just say skip that step. Okay, I should be at this point right now. <coughs> there you are, John. You're good. Uh, no, you're, you're just, you just need to wait a little bit, go, go then, you, so you just put your phone down or your computer down and then you went and did something else then eventually you got access from me. Again, this is what, the glitch, the problems we're having here is not really what we're interested in talking about today because this is just how the grace period situation works. So, um, and yet this is, you know, this is a huge thing for students. If they give up after a while, they're going to be like, this, this course sucks because I can't even get into the Yep. Right? But like I said, this would be just the one to whom, one student to whom I'd write a lengthy email saying, just hold on. Right. This is the deal that you're getting. <laughs> yeah. The student, uh, I am Georgina. Oh, I, oh. Hola. Hola. Um, the student goes to, through the same process that we are doing. Yep, also. the student goes to it very close to the same process. The, the, they either buy their book online through Vista, which we try to get them to do because Vista sells it more cheaply. 
Vista sells it more cheaply to our students here because they um, because uh, we have so many students in the class. I was able to negotiate about seventy the twenty two dollar difference, a drop in price for them, so it's one hundred and fifty dollars. And they if they buy it online, once they go through the steps of buying it online. Um, for example, I send them, they have a link, they can buy it directly from the UW store in Vista or they can buy it um, on their own. Once they go through those steps, it tells you step by step how to log in, how to find your instructor. It walks you through the whole thing, uh, how to find your school. And we barely need to even tell students how to do that. The TAs that are teaching for the first time are so surprised during our orientation. They look and they're, oh, all my students are there already. So they're already s sitting in their class, um, their online class. It's a pretty seamless process usually. This is the only part that's not seamless. So apologize for this little um, glitch, but I think we're good. So, um, so here's, let me tell you some of the problems that we might have or some of the advantages we have. So let me go, let me go to that landing page where you are. Is everybody in now, pretty much? Everybody's okay? Yes. So thanks. So, um, okay. So this is where I'm looking to get your um, advice later in, um, in the hour. So this is what the students should see um, in the landing page when they, when they get there. Um, one of the first things students will do, they see the assignments, they can see what's overdue assignments, and they can see what, when things are due, what's are coming up. I only got a few assignments in there for you, so that might be populated a little bit, a lot more. Um, most students just hit this start button right here, and they start doing assignments. One of the issues is, so it's uh, maybe a Vista issue too, is they start doing assignments without maybe um, looking at their textbook, without even studying, because a lot of them grew up with things like LeapFrog and ABC Mouse <laughs> and things, where all the learning, well, the computer's gonna teach me how to do this, and all the learning's gonna happen here. So um, we have to reiterate a bunch of times how to, how to study first. I'll show you Vista has a solution to that if we have time in the end, a new platform that, that, that has come out this year. They have a solution that, that helps um, kind of force students to do the studying ahead of time. Um, the My Study Center sounds exciting. This dictionary just sends them to Word Reference. As you can see, it just sends them to Word Reference. And it, does, it links outside of this platform, which is not a good idea. That should be changed. Vocabulary tools for this book, um, basically um, what, what they get is they can, uh, so here's all the vocabulary sections. They can either choose them all or none or one. Um, they can do the words in French and English, and they can do flashcards. Um, you know, they can get rid of the, um, well, there's that. Oh, but très bien. And so um, there's another way to do vocabulary, which I'll show you in just a little bit as well. Um, do you have a chance to click on the video down here? I'll show it up here. Um, I don't have sound hooked up. So um, all the videos, it's really nice, all the videos they have in this most of these uh, upper level classes are um, not Jean-Marc and Marie Chantal go to a cafe, let's listen to their discussion. They're real um, award-winning video shorts and then they have real commercials. Hello. Bonjour, chérie. C'est papa. Tiens, prends Allo, madame. Bonjour, madame. As I do this, watch what I can do with the subtitles. Je vais aller au cinéma café. Et raconte-moi, c'était comment l'école aujourd'hui I can read along this way if I want. So. So that's a commercial with an activity um, associated with it. These are, by the way, these are things I can turn on and off as the instructor. I can let them see these French subtitles or the French transcript or not. I can decide how they, they do that. So, what does hints do? Um, well, let me click on that. Sorry. No, that's okay. I click on it on my own. Because like uh, it was right here. Right. Uh, I don't really, let's see. Yeah. Um, no, but that's a really good idea. Highlight the actual vocabulary words from the section 
in the in the script. I should actually write that down. Um, that's a good idea. Let me show you, since we're talking about that, I promise I'm not really here to, to impress you with everything, but let me show you something else uh, that, um, actually no, it's in one of our activities, so I won't show you. So let's go to the second activity right now about assignments. One of the problems that we have is students, like I said, quickly just go to the start button and do the assignments that are um, assigned to them. Right now, uh, estimated four minutes are left because I, I myself did some of these assignments. Um, but let's do it a different way so you can see the types of activities. If, if you go up to content and activities here, these are, now there's, this is something that I think our students do a good job figuring out. Um, these are all my chapters here, or lessons. These are specific sections in the book. And by the way, we give them an orientation on the second day of class on, about how all this works. And then these are the activities, and they follow along exactly, this follows along exactly how the book is set up page um, section by section, so there's a lot of continuity. Um, there's a, a question, so some of our questions here is uh, note this status and due date reminder for each activity, which you might see over here, like I viewed it, I got a 0% on that one. I you got, really did a terrible job. Yep, yeah, I'm not a very good <laughs> <laughs> language learner, right? It tells me when they're due, which is nice. Um, and then uh, in the left-hand column, we talked about this right here, these icons, which um, they sometimes don't pay attention to. Can you guess what some of these icons mean? For example, this, this thing right here. This one. With it right there. That's actually, so we don't use it. It's more used for uh, distance ed. Those, that's when you can have students do virtual chats or real chats. So this is a virtual chat. This fellow here actually is going to... Uh, Est-ce que tu deviens anxieuse quand il y a beaucoup de monde? Sorry, somebody yeah. already. Yeah, so... You should listen to it, because it's hilarious. John did this yesterday, and he just answered random things. It was super awesome. Oh. That's, well, it's, <laughs> it's good. That's fine. Can you reset that? Uh, I, I actually can. It takes me, uh, I, I need to go back to the, my, my thing. I can reset it. But it's nice. You know, so it's a virtual chat, and then you can do real chats. And by the way, if you, if you do t distance ed right now, you can see um, this is everybody in our class right here now, all together. And we, I can make them do virtual chats. I can set up specific times. I can choose um, whether chat is active all the time or only when virtual chats are assigned. So it's kind of fun. Again, that helps really more with distance ed. We do lots of chat in class, and they get four days a week of that. So I, I think that's, um, that works OK. So that's what that one is. Earphones, of course, is listening. Um, this little mouse, it doesn't really, but you can see. This is the same exact activity that's in the textbook. So what we often quite do is we have students um, prepare that activity at home. They come into class, they don't have their computers, that's okay. They already did the activity, we do it again in class. They should be good at doing that activity. This little apple means that the teacher needs to come in and grade it um, as well. So um, those are more helpful for the teacher than anything else. So the big question about this at the end of this, which, is, which I can't answer, and that um, John really asks is how would all this look in D2L or Moodle or Canvas if we were just to have, make our own sites like this. I bet you have ideas to begin with. Well, one of the things that I, that I thought was really cool about this site is it gives the students um, sort of these reminders with the dashboard of like, hey, you've got these three assignments. They take 45 minutes to do. And if you look on the calendar, you can see that if you do it, and I saw that on, um, on your site, you had some sections, or, or, or your TAs, had some sections where they had them all assigned due by Wednesday or whatever, mm -hmm. and it was like four and a half hours of, of, of homework. Huh. And then others assigned, uh, other sections said, do this one by this day, and it's 30 minutes. Do this one by this day, it's 12 minutes. You know, and that all added up to yep. that same amount of time. But it was less intimidating for the students who would be like, oh, I don't have anything to do until Wednesday. And then they open it up on Wednesday, and they see that there's four and a half hours of homework to do, and they're like, ugh. Yeah. can't do this. And it gets to that idea of distributed learning where if you play around the content every day, even if it's only 30 minutes or 12 right. minutes or whatever, these four minute assignments, you're going to have... It works, it works really well for our, our two day a week. It works well for all our classes, but our two day a week classes, we try to have them do homework um, sp spread out throughout the week, and so that works well. RTAs are not supposed to assign all that for one day, <laughs> like you, you probably saw. It's supposed to be parsed out day by day where they have um, 
probably we like to have them about 40 minutes of uh, 40 minutes on here, which means we're asking at least 20 minutes, if not an hour and 20 minutes, of studying before they do the homework there, which they don't do, of course. But we try we try to get them to do that. But things like so the advantage of having all of these assignments sort of pre-made by the textbook company is that they've got the data of you know tens of thousands of students, so they can say the average student takes 30 minutes on this assignment. As individual instructors, we don't necessarily know, like we create assignments all the time, and we're like, it feels like for us it should take 10 minutes, but we don't know how much time it actually takes for the students, so it's harder for us to give them the estimates. Yeah. But I think that the estimates are super helpful probably. They're very helpful. One thing to know, those estimates are, they use high school and college data. College students are supposedly better and quicker, so that's easier. And then for language learners, I don't know if you know, you've ever heard this before, language teachers, we usually say one sixth. If a teacher can do something in 10 minutes, it should take um, uh, 60 minutes for your students mm -hmm. normally <coughs> for certain things. So um, we're, we're going to move on a little bit. Um, let's see. Yeah. So I'm going to show you a couple more things. I guess I'm really, what I'm really trying to show you is how this can be um, all the extra tools that the students have at their disposal. So just quickly, you've seen maybe online flashcards. This is something that I don't know if we can do yet. Charmant, charmante. And then you just simply have to say, I know it or I didn't know it. And you can choose, you know, again, which, which flashcard sets you do. So it's a good, um, good test. You can switch the other way around if you want. Um, OK, thank you. So and I have to think of what that word is. La, las. Um, which can be pretty helpful. Um, the other thing I wanted to show you, which is kind of fun, there's this, uh, the, the actual, so when students buy their book, they can right away um, get a, a, a virtual access to the book and every single page is in there. And I think um, I mentioned the activities, is this look at page 37, if you can on yours, or I'll just show it right here. So this is a two page spread, this is a very, very famous French poem, it's almost cliche. Um, so we're looking at page 37. There, this is what's really, one of the things that's really great about this. Sous le pont Mirabeau coule la Seine, et nos amours, faut-il qu'ils m'en souviennent La joie venait toujours après la peine. First of all, his French is really beautiful. Um, so they're highlighting the sentence that's being spoken. This book is catching up right now. Um, the, some of the Spanish versions and our older French version actually, it highlighted also the exact word that's being spoken at the same exact time. So it's a very good learning tool, I think, for students. I would say 98% of our students don't do this, for example, even though we ask them to and assign it to them, they don't bother doing it. I, I talk to them at the end of the semester or in the middle of the semester, I say, oh, do you do your readings online? Well, yeah, I read it online. Do you, do you listen to them as well? What do you mean? And we've showed it to them and everything, but they just don't take advantage of this learning tool, I don't think. Um, so yeah, so I, we're kind of in one of the bigger question areas now is, is how would you, having seen all these resources, uh, first of all, it's pretty good, don't you think? You, I think, so I don't know, you, you teach language, do you, what do you think? Yeah, um, well, I am online now. Uh -huh. General, actual yeah. Article, yeah. But no French. Oh. Except my first point for a student and go to that page. Maybe, I don't know. I know that it's uh, outside of the textbook already. But yeah. I think it's a Sous le pont Mirabeau coule la Sorry. Seine. Help the students. Et nos amours. Um, the other thing uh, um, I asked you, uh, in, when they practice vocabulary, can they record their voice and yep. compare? Yep. Oh, they can't compare. They can't compare yet, but that's, uh, that's what happens with Rosetta Stone right now. It, it compares wavelengths, um, and we don't, it doesn't do that yet, I don't think. So there isn't that. But there's, there's, uh, they can do vocabulary with their um, teacher, with their partner chats, things like that. So there you can hear. Can I clarify that? Yeah. It'll show the, the wavelength of like, the, the French speak with a beautiful voice, and then compare your wavelength? Rosetta Stone. It? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, last, I haven't looked at Rosetta Stone in years, but yeah, it was doing that. So you say something and it compares the two and it tells you how, how good you did comparing. I think that would come into play with um, more with a lot of other languages, actually. Perhaps with French, too. That's so. why I think still need a lot of work, though. Yeah. 
Yeah. yeah. Um, so I have known native speakers who have used that and have not been successful. Um, so it kind of depends on, you know, for example, somebody from Puerto Rico, they have a very distinct accent when they speak Spanish. So it's not going to come out <coughs> necessarily accurately, which is why a lot of um, tools aren't integrating that so much because of the lack of accuracy there. Well, and I would also think like you know, the, the tone of the voice, do I have a deep voice, do I have a high pitched voice, like does that, that would affect it too, wouldn't it? It may probably not so much. What's interesting that I liked about this is when I first clicked on the chat <coughs> feature, is it asks if you're male or female. <laughs> right. So that it adjusts, you know, the, the way that they ask questions being gender appropriate, things like that. That, can, that is a really nice feature. Um, but I don't, you know, nothing's gonna replace the reality of speaking to a real human, right? No. right? Um, and then the other, the other piece of that is if you're looking for just being comprehensible, did you communicate your message? You may not have to be 100% accurate to do that. So yeah. this wave thing So I think, I think this is a, ignoring that comparing wavelength thing. They're coming up with the partner chats. The other thing they have in the, some of the Spanish books, that, that's their biggest market. So that's where they put all their efforts to begin with. You saw that virtual chat where there, that smiling guy was there and talking. They've got them now where it's a video, the person is actually speaking. The virtual person is actually speaking to you and then you, you actually speak back to that person. Record it, your teacher can listen to it and, and, and chime in and tell you what's going on with that. Are you using this in a flipped lesson kind of format? That's kind of the idea. We're not completely flipped, but yeah, flipped. They're supposed to, I try to get the TAs to, TAs quite often really want to feel good about teaching grammar and vocabulary in class because that's what they master. So they keep sliding and defaulting to that. But what we try to get them to do is to experience the language in class and let them do the learning at home. Right. So I, I visit classes and quite often almost my, my biggest um, bit of advice to TAs all the time is maybe two minutes on this, not 10 minutes on that, and then more time doing other things. Mm -hmm. There's a, so there's that virtual chat, and then there's a, which I didn't assign, so you didn't see, there's a student to student chat, which um, sort of the distance ed uh, people use all the time, much more than me. When I go to these VISTA um, meetings, um, I sit there quiet during that point, because I don't really understand the um, ins and outs of teaching online. But yeah, so they have to, with them and their partner, they have to set up a time and do a partner chat, and there's video there as well, so that you can see them both, they're both there, and the teacher can look at that and see that they did it. So one can be in Sault Ste. Marie, and the other one can be in Tucson, and then they, they do the partner chat and the teacher gets to see that. The, the other thing I didn't show you, I think I'm thinking about is if uh, students doing activities online, uh, they can um, flag a certain activity. They, they click a little thing that says help from teacher and they, they can click the actual item and write in a comment, I don't understand what happened here. So, um, which is pretty helpful. It also, if they make mistakes, it hints, gives them hints about the type of mistakes that they made. Um, so, how do, you th how do you think I should approach, or we should approach, even though we give them a very lengthy email, it's nicely set up so the student can re even read it quickly and find what the student needs, I think. We give them um, uh, uh, an orientation. In the syllabus, we explain step by step everything, how not to get frustrated. We tell them things like in the beginning, accents don't count because it's frustrating. You miss one accent and then, um, you know, it says you're wrong. Or um, uh, punctuation doesn't count, capitalization doesn't count in the beginning, just to get students more comfortable. And then we add those functions in. I just have to check a box and capitalization counts, for example. Um, but some students still report. I read, um, I read evaluations of the class and there's you know, a lot of them are pretty okay with it, but then there's two or three students, or maybe sometimes more, I hate the book. And we love the book, it's really good. I think they get very frustrated. These are, you know, the students that are just doing their homework and it's not working out and they're getting it wrong and they don't understand. They get a 33% on an activity and instead of thinking about it and fixing it, they get three tries to do the activity. They just flag it for the teacher, say, why is this wrong, why is this wrong, why is this wrong? They're, they're not really taking it upon themselves to do the learning, even though we try to show them that that's what their role is, that's what they need to do, that's part of their homework, actually. Also, third semester French, for example, is 
almost all of the grammar is review. We've actually done it in the first and second semester. So we're not teaching them anything really that new. We're going deeper into it, mastering it a little bit more, but nothing new. So, so I think you, you, you touched on this in our discussion in your office is that, um, well, at the beginning here, they grew up with LeapFrog. They grew up with ABC Mouse, yeah. A, you know, all the stuff is on the computer. They didn't have to go back and forth. This reading that you're talking about, reading directions, <laughs> you know, that's not part of their, the way that they grew up. So where do you see this, and I, I think this is probably for the rest of you as well, a question, where do you see this going in the future? Is it all going to be? Well, can I stop you for one second? Yeah. I'm going to show you where it's going to go in the future <laughs> in, in a second. Uh, but, but my class right now won't have this for at least a few years. So how would you better um, help me motivate our students to do a better job and take advantage of all these resources that they have? Yeah. So what does your orientation look like? Does it look like your TA is walking them through, or do they get hands-on? They get hands-on. So the orientation is usually the second day of class, and we have in a lab, and they're given some activities to do. The teacher can watch, walk around and see what they're doing when they do these activities. Um, I've never actually given them a, a paced step-by-step -step thing. I've assigned the activities that they do in the class. I've never said to the TAs, do exactly this, exactly this. So maybe you know, a script for the TAs for orientation, that might be a, a, a good step right there. Or if you made short screencasts of how everything works, mm -hmm. so that they can you know, see a quick three, three to five minute video and they can play it again and again and again. Andrew, is the frustration that they don't know where to go on the site, or is the frustration that they're not getting everything right 100% accurate? Because those are two very mm -hmm. different problems. Yeah. I think I would say my frustration is they don't take, care, take advantage of the tools that are on the site to help them learn better sometimes. Their frustration is they type something and get it wrong. Okay. Um, in the technology I'm going to show you just briefly in a few minutes, um, uh, I got frustrated because it's, the French version is just a try. It's not out yet. It's not out in the public yet. And I typed in something and I typed in a period. And the period was actually visible after the space. And I typed in a period after all these sentences because the word came towards the end and I got them all wrong. <laughs> What's wrong with this? So I guess my <coughs> take on that would be two things. One, um, first, talking to the students about the fact that you're, they're growing communicative proficiency, that they're trying to communicate information, and it doesn't have to be 100% accurate. They're not 100% accurate even in their own language. So that's the first, that would be my first step. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing is that verbalizing the fact that a computer is going to be a black and white answer. Language is not black and white. There may be 500 different ways you can say or express the same thing. Mm -hmm. So not getting frustrated, you know, just verbalizing that ahead of time. Don't get frustrated if you really think that you did the right thing and, you know, your period is yeah. in the wrong place or something because the computer is going to look for something very exact. Right. So I think if you say that up front, it might sort of lower that stress, stress level. level going right. into it. Right. On our um, information for the class, which is all in English and the <laughs> syllabus, and the information is almost three quarters of a page, if not more, dedicated to don't get frustrated in bold and italics with an exclamation point. <laughs> it actually says it there. But we need to somehow probably reiterate that but more. And, and explain it in a way that, you know, computers are black and white, and communication is not. So be OK with that. Yeah. And that's all part of learning. I'm writing this down. Georgina, you had something. Uh, I would say I would add more context instead of just going to the vocabulary. You mm -hmm. know, uh, oh, yeah. Uh, like a dictionary, uh, like um, those videos of mm -hmm. more real life yeah. situation. Highlight them and work with them. Maybe a question using that word so they realize more how to use it, even they cannot spell it. Recognize the word in right. context first. So would motivate them that they need to learn these words better than just going and memorizing the text. Yeah. The, the, the so you're hitting on what's the, what's happening next with them is they have a new uh, uh, platform out and it's used right now with two books. One called Portales and the other one's called Portail. And um, these are uh, let me let me show you. Um, 
So here, this is, here's one thing with context that you might like. Um, Click on the audio icons to listen to the words. So first of all, they walk you through, this is uh, something that's added on. They know the students aren't paying attention, so I can get rid of this overlay if I want. And please don't show me this again if I want. I'm going to leave it up, though. So here, in context, um, they can. La jugadora. And if I want to, I can do that. Visitan el monumento. So that, Visitar. that's pretty helpful. Um, later, we go back to this picture, actually. Vocabulary tutorials, they broke up the vocabulary a lot. So Start the tutorial. This is a multi, um, this is shows you that there is a solution to some of the stuff we're talking to. I need a solution for now. Listen and repeat the words. For the next few years. La pelota. Um, I can choose El fútbol. fast if I want, for example. So La jugadora. this is the type of context you're talking about. El jugador. Oh, sorry. Mm -hmm. It's a very old picture. Oh, I yeah, saw yeah, it yeah. In Spanish uh, long ago. So I, I could say more real life situation, more like the videos you have, you know, and something else that they can connect to the vocabulary in, in a natural way. And mm -hmm. How to use it, I don't know, in maybe, I don't know, in business or in psychology, whichever they study, even, you know, they can use those words. Mm -hmm. I, I think um, what I was showing was that the learning phase of the vocabulary, and then if you go down, these put things more in context, I think. Um, there's one activity you have to simply choose if the vocabulary word is a place, a sport, or a pastime, for example. Um, so so that's, there are solutions, but right now... You were wondering, you were talking about uh, difficulty in getting the students to use the user interface. Mm -hmm. I can. And, and yeah. walk them through, first walk them through that um, the, oh. the user interface and then have a quiz afterwards, an open book quiz especially, that, that really guides them through the highlighted points that you really want them to see. Like, this is a really important thing to go to. And this is how you use it. And then have a small open book quiz that can walk through that and, and make it more, um, and, and, uh, make it more uh, an obvious and explicit wording objective to learn the content here, learn the user interface. Because they're expecting LeapFrog because they were trained yep. to use LeapFrog. They know, now they need to be trained to use this because they'll keep referring back to what they know unless they're trained That's really smart. and reviewed on how to do that. Do you know I didn't, I don't even know why I never thought about that. It seems so simple and clear. I can create content or I can create assessment exercises where they have to go and do this stuff, mm -hmm. I think. And I think that will help them with the supplemental material because they'll know it's there more mm -hmm. quickly and they won't get into a pattern of, of using this where they aren't using right. that because they, they figure out easiest way to get there, but if you introduce them earlier on to more robust learning that's solutions. Cool, yeah. That's a really good idea. And the other aspect is don't call it supplemental. Like, oh, you know I mean? like, integral. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that. It's like, oh, this is just extra stuff. Okay, I've already ignored it. I'm just going to focus on what I need to do to get my grade. And return back to that, su that quote unquote supplemental stuff. Um, make it more integrated in part of it. Because I remember as an undergrad and myself, I looked through the reading list, required, supplemental. I didn't even finish mm -hmm. the second line mm -hmm. because of supplemental. It obviously meant it's not important. Right. And so it's, it means what we need to do then as instructors is this stuff is, yeah, you maybe don't quote unquote need it to get the grade, but it's something that will really help you and really get a better grade. You and yeah. really emphasize that throughout and, and, and come back to it and, and use it in the class or, mm -hmm. or talk about it so that's such a way that it reinforces to them that they need to use it. And maybe even again have low stakes quizzes about that supplemental material yeah. or even have bonus question with that supplemental material to reinforce that it's important and also give them some sort of accountability for doing That's it. That's a really smart idea, yeah. So and this could allow me to do that. It means stop reading, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, it just means trans here. Yeah, so, yeah. Because yeah. they're doing what they basically need to do. And so that's this would also be able to create your content. Also, lets you, gives you an opportunity to add some very relevant, real life, daily, like last week's news stuff into mm -hmm. yeah. to, to oh, add yeah. to this course. Yeah, I can choose the type of content. Um, I've never created content. I've gone through it, but um, I don't think I'm logged in as the right kind of person to be able to create content right now. But um, maybe it's over here. I don't know. Uh, uh, sorry. Hold on. Ooh. 
too. I don't know where. I should know. I'm supposed to know this stuff, and I don't. But um, somewhere. I can create quizzes, I can create a partner chat, I can create a video, I can create lots of things. A lot of online teachers in creating content create a video of them just talking to their students saying what needs to go on. But we can create an assessment thing where it says, go to page 37, uh, click on the icon, is this a male or a female speaking? True, oh, you know what I mean? Oh, yeah. Yes or no? That could be one thing right there, force them to go there. Yeah. Good, good. That's exactly what I mean, we I want. That's yeah. What you want to yeah, yeah. Do. So I'm very new to this, and then you know, like this is so great. If I was going to learn French or another language, <coughs> and oh, like there's so many things in there that I could use, but I, I'm like I'm not sure what what's in there unless mm -hmm. you showed me. And even when you showed me, you know, it, it's like so many things. Yeah. I couldn't overwhelming. Yeah. Like you want me to pick up, but by using the interfaces in there to get to the learning goal, so that would then help me to uh, tap on whatever resources <coughs> that Vista has put up. I I, I think especially the point of it being overwhelming is is um, something that they're working on. This is t one before. This is one platform before the one we're using in third semester, and you can just tell by looking at it. It's, it's harder for students to figure out what's going around. It's set up in a weird way. For older teachers, this is these are things that are related to a book. These are things that are related to a workbook, which we don't even really use anymore. Do you remember having a workbook associated with a textbook? And so this is you know you might, you have activities here, and then you have activities here that are about the same thing, but they're on completely different tabs. So they've tried; they're working on making it less overwhelming. But even for uh, instructors, it's still pretty overwhelming at first. Megan and then Emily. Yeah. From the literature and active learning, that you need to be explicit about why you're doing the what, what mm -hmm. you're doing and repeat those messages because otherwise students might just look at this and go, "This is overwhelming. This is a lot of work. Yep. Why are they making me do this? Why do I have to work so hard?" Yeah. And so I'm wondering if being really explicit about if there's research behind these techniques, particularly in foreign language, to say we know teaching foreign language in this way, and I don't, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah really helps facilitate student learning mm -hmm. and that's why we're using it. That's good. Be a more upfront and articulate that, which we don't I don't actually. So I we say the book is a, I say it's a powerful learning companion, but I don't say why. So that's a very good and idea. They might interpret that in a lot of different ways. Yeah. There are some students coming from other school districts um, in the country that use uh, books from different publishers that are that are similar. I don't know if you've seen some of the things that are put out in biology and chemistry for some of these very wealthy and non-wealthy, like LA County school districts, where it's just amazing, our friend is a publisher, what they do, what the chemistry book can do online for these students, it's just, it's crazy. So some students are more apt, more ready to do this than others. You had something? Well, I was just saying, when you go in, there's so many activities, mm -hmm. and they're kind of, a lot of them to repeat yep. a little bit, so like maybe you can learn vocabulary this way, or this way, or this way, or this way. What about like slowly introducing them each to just one of them? Mm -hmm. Instead of all of them at once, and right. then, like learn. <laughs> Be like, hey, this week we're going to try using this to learn the vocabulary. Next week we'll try this to learn the vocabulary. And then you can start adding them on. So like maybe by week four, you've gone through the four different types of ways to learn vocabulary. And now you give them the option to pick one, and you can get them all there. That's a really good but idea. But to me, I was overwhelmed by how many mm -hmm. activities it looks like a ton of work. And it eventually can be repetitive. Right, so right. This. That's, you know, we don't do that either. Uh, introducing a, a few activities in the first lesson, more activities the second, more activities the third. Yeah, actually getting more into the book. That's a pretty good idea. I double underlined that. Thanks. 
Or not even more activity, but different, right? Yeah, yeah. Be, yeah, or different, yeah, yeah. So you have to do yeah. three things each lesson, but they're three different things. So then by lesson four, you've done all the types. Oh, yeah. That's what I was hearing from. Yeah, that's what I was saying. And yeah. then you could introduce all of them at once if you had picked the one that, that you, you want to do. For you. Yeah. yeah. Um, but and I know we, he wants to wrap up, but quickly, I forgot to mention something about Lauren that's related to this as well. <laughs> uh, they're told explicitly that the homework grade they get here is not their homework grade. It's going to inform their homework grade. The, they get the grade, the teacher looks at it and says, you know, whatever, the, they, 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 they curve it at the end because there are some activities students will get a 60 on. And so um, they're not, they can't, they don't freak out, which that was a good, one good plus that I, change I made a few years ago, being explicit and saying, and I should learn from that lesson of being explicit, this is not your homework grade. This is how you're doing on this online thing. Your homework grade will probably be better than that. So don't freak out. No, I don't. They yeah. can see the cumulative average and effort, which is one of the things on that, that I also love. So when they see their grade, they see their grade, but then they also see right next to their grade a rundown of how much effort they put in based on how much time, time. they spent on it, how, and compared to the cumulative class or average class, how much, um, how many attempts they've seen, they've made on these things. So they can kind of see that oh, I'm only getting to see. Oh, but I've only spent much less than the average yeah. class person. Used to, so that's kind of a neat way to... used to be nice like, for us as teachers, too, when students say, I don't get it. And you can look and say, well, yeah, in three minutes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but you it's put it back in your handout. I think John put a couple screenshots on there that show kind of some of that yeah. student effort. Yeah.